Africa by donating old clothing, electronics, and other consumer goods, even old cars. Churches and charities hold drives to collect household goods. Schools send old computers and books. Hospitals donate used medical equipment. And while all of this may start out as well-intentioned donating, it can end up as dumping, causing harm to the economy, environment, and even society in general. Hello, I'm Carol Pino. Welcome to our show, Africa USA Now, current events at the intersection of Africa and the United States. Our program is presented by the World Trade Center, Washington, D.C., and supported by the African Development Bank and Africa Investment Forum. To understand how donating can end up as dumping, it's important to look at both the scale and what happens when these goods arrive in Africa. We're going to look at electronics, cars, and other goods later in the program. But let's start with the one that has gotten the most press, secondhand clothing. U.S. fashion trends have made it so styles come and go at an alarming rate, and the low price point makes it so consumers buy more and more. But that also means more clothing is discarded at a faster rate. Where does it go? One-third goes to Africa. Every week, 15 million used garments arrive in the markets of Accra, the capital of Ghana. Across the continent, in Kenya, 184,000 tons of used clothing were imported in 2021. This is big business, $1.84 billion annually. This huge glut of secondhand clothing can cripple domestic manufacturing that could have made inexpensive local clothing, thereby creating jobs and respecting that country's own styles. These goods are often brought into Africa by for-profit businesses, who are fighting for market share just as much as any other business. Countries that have tried to limit or even ban secondhand goods often deal with significant pushback. Let's bring in our guests to talk about the issues. Antoine Tony Kajangwe, Director General of Trade and Investment, Rwanda Ministry of Trade and Industry. Gail Strickler, President for Global Trade at Brookfield Associates and former Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Textiles. And Joseph Oliech, manager of the WE Center, the Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment Center. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Tony, the Rwandan government came out strongly against secondhand clothing. Why did you do it, and what was the reaction? We implemented a new policy, industrialization policy, called the Made in Rwanda policy. And part of that policy was to look at how we can develop an industrial base uh, across several sectors, uh, really looking at uh, sectors which are labor intensive, low skill, and also um, wouldn't require a lot of capital. We implemented a policy to increase the cost of importing secondhand uh, clothing, thereby encouraging domestic production and local industrial development. It's also a social and cultural issue as well. Telling somebody that they'll essentially buy uh, or they're buying uh, an undergarment that's been used and worn by somebody else. It takes something out of your own self-dignity and self-worth. Uh, and, and that was a strong point for us as, as Rwandans. Impact of this, however, uh, has been uh, impactful, if, if, if I can put it that way. Rwanda participates in the America Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA. Uh, and this is, of course, a unilateral trading arrangement that the U.S. provides to uh, low-income countries uh, in Africa as part of their generalized systems of preferences. When Rwanda implemented this policy, uh, we were uh, notified that Rwanda would no longer be able to export apparel products uh, to the U.S. market. The argument being that this was discriminatory to U.S. Uh, uh, to U.S. businesses, U.S. industries, specifically the worn clothing, secondhand clothing. But this was, at the end of the day, a decision, a policy decision that could offer job creation to uh, mushroom and for economic growth to uh, take root. And that's what we've seen seven years into implementation. Gail, you, you've done so much work in this. Um... Tell us about the situation behind the scenes. This whole situation to me is really just absurd on so many levels. The African Growth and Opportunity Act and the 37 countries that have what they call textile visas, which means they are allowed to produce apparel 
um, and send it duty-free to the United States is exactly because we want job creation. So the very idea that the same agreement that was put in place to try to help job creation, help, help economic growth throughout the African continent is then used against them to take it away from them because they don't want to let us dump our garbage there is just ludicrous. Typically what happens is people go and they donate their used clothing. The best apparel is taken off and sold in the store. The things that are of lower quality, they start to sell or give in some cases to these third party recyclers who cause the trouble. There's a relatively large amount of business, but it doesn't employ the thousands of people that they claimed when they came to speak to us. This particular action during the Trump administration really turned a go up in my view, you know, upside down. And this was an absurd um, contamination or uh, of the of this agreement. 98% of the apparel sold and worn by Americans is made somewhere else. In our free trade agreements, particularly textiles and apparel are treated with such stringent rules of origin that in some cases an item can have as little as 1% made somewhere else in the case of a spandex fiber. That would actually mean that they would not get preference. So you know you're holding up this shirt, this shirt that says made in China, made in Bangladesh, and then we're going to tell African countries that because it was for some period of time on the backs of an American, it now qualifies as a product of the United States and that they are not receiving our product that I find ludicrous. Joseph, what does it look like on the ground where a lot of this ends up being dumped? Kenya is almost a middle income economy, but uh, the small population that we have in, in, in our informal settlements is, uh, experiences uh, huge negative effects, uh, discarded clothing uh, that blocks every sector, every pathway that water could, could pass through. And even the drainage systems, they are all, 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 most of them are blocked, causing a huge problem to, uh, uh, that is the public health negatively, and also environmentally, it is it's a big problem in these areas. Um, most of the second-hand clothing that we get in this country, some of them come with uh, um, uh, the dangers uh, with them. You know, uh, they have bacterial, uh, fungal, and uh, viral um, infections. Um, most of these people in these environments, they do not have enough water that they could use to clean this clothing and, 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 and of course, sterilize them. And therefore, that spreads within that ecosystem because sanitation is not very good. Besides that, besides the environmental aspect of it, uh, there is a huge negative social and economic effect on the population. Uh, in my own home, home village, for example, uh, when I was young, um, we used to have cotton processing factory in my village um, in, in the late 80s and early 90s. But this factory went dead. Uh, my father, for example, besides his uh, professional medical career, he's been a farmer. And I used to visit his uh, cotton farm when I was young. And um, in, in, in the early 90s, uh, cotton farming stopped. Many families who took their children to school through money generated from cotton farming. And all these has died as a result of uh, cheap uh, second-hand clothing coming from uh, the developed countries, mostly from the West. And um, in this country, we have close to 5.2 million young Kenyans who are out of employment. That is, uh, the employable young Kenyans who are not employed out of a population of um, roughly 55 million. And uh, if you were to have a very vibrant textile industry, uh, cotton uh, and, and many other textile products generated internally, we would be able to create more jobs for these young people. For the restriction on Rwandan apparel products, we actually had factories that were producing for the American consumer, right? Uh, yeah. And for the American fashion brands, which is a far larger industry and market than the recyclers that uh, objected to Rwanda's policy uh, regime. So you kind of wonder at which 
lobbying group in, in a sense was louder in this sense, right? Rwanda is, is losing out on export uh, figures and, and, and revenue, but American consumers at the end of the day, they're also losing out. Fortunately, I think the voice of the recycling industry in, in, in the US far outweighed uh, that of, of fashion brands that were looking for a sourcing market. Tony, I think you make the perfect point, which is a better lobbying job, as horrible as that is. I really, and I begged the East African community, don't fight it as the garbage, fight it on the rules of origin. Go to the WTO and say, we will gladly take every item of clothing that says made in USA on the back. And then they would have to admit that they here they were on one hand trying to start Section 301 actions against China at the same time of telling you, you have to welcome in made in Chinese garbage. The retailers and brands who most could benefit from having additional sourcing, particularly now when they're feeling so threatened on their exports from China under the Uyghur, um, the acts, you know, the Congressional uh, Act against um, using forced labor, um, that they missed the opportunity to help the Rwandan industry grow and therefore grow additional sources of duty-free apparel that they desperately want right now. And we should add that when this started, when Rwanda first came forward with this, it wasn't Rwanda alone. There were several African countries. Yeah. Rwanda, Tanzania, and Kenya. It's very hard for an administration to take on the United States. I think the United States is waking up to the fact that um, they have not had the kind of role that they should have in helping the African continent to develop and to develop sustainably. I think at the same time, Africa is realizing that some of the help that they got from other countries came with other strings attached, or maybe, you know, and uh, there were other downsides. So this is a really good time to relook at these kind of issues and work together. And I think on the back of the U.S.-Africa summit, this is definitely the time to, to start re-looking at, at some of these policy decisions that have been taken. But that being said, AGOA is also expiring in two years. We're developing the, uh, and implementing the Africa Continental Free Trade Area uh, Agreement. right? And, and a lot of what it's going to require beyond trade policy of developing regional value chain, chains is also protecting the African market from secondhand clothing to allow those domestic industries to develop. So it, there, I think it's a very dynamic and, and evolving policy situation right now. Let's move on to electronics. Every year, Apple comes out with new iPhones. Computers and tablets gain more power and capabilities. If you're using a device that's more than three or four years old, it's probably a clunker by now. Hundreds of containers arrive in Africa every day labeled as used electronics. But a huge percentage, as much as 70%, according to some reports, are beyond repair. This is e-waste, which is the fastest growing waste stream in the world. Those old electronics contain hazardous materials, including mercury, lead, and flame retardants. Not only does it destroy the environment, but for the thousands of people, often children, who earn their livelihoods doing informal recycling of e-waste, the toxic blend makes it a hazardous environment. Dumping e-waste in Africa should be illegal, according to the Basel Convention on Hazardous Waste. But remember, those containers are marked used electronics, not e-waste. Joseph, dealing with e-waste is exactly what your company does. Tell us about the situation. At Waste Center, we try to um, manage electronic waste that is generated in this country. Kenya is a, a developing economy, and we're also having a swelling uh, middle-class group the purchasing power is increasing. And that means more electronic devices uh, will keep on coming into the market. The US that is collected and the waste that is collected from the households goes directly to the general dump site, where uh, people would go there to earn their livelihood. Recycling, there are those who also get valuable components from electronic devices. The things that are not of, of value to them they're left there and they're the most toxic uh, component, which in turn pollutes soil when it rains, the toxins in these motherboards and these electronic devices, they get into our the waterways. They pollute the soil. 
the fish will also take up the toxic heavy metal. But now when you eat them, there is that long food chain poisoning that gets to you, the gases coming from informal areas where electronic waste is processed affects children a lot. We are trying to integrate the element of urban mining because we are cognizant of the fact that um, e-waste has a direct effect on our public health and the environment. So how do you clean it up? What we have as a policy, internal policy, is a zero dumping policy. Everything that we collect, we look at the circularity in it. Are there components that could be refurbished for reuse? Are there components that could be used as spare parts, that is components to other devices so that they can be functional? Are there fractions that we could extract to be raw materials that could also feed into the manufacturing industry to be uh, elements within components as new products? We have in-house strategies and analyses and the uh, tests that we do to make sure that the toxins are actually neutralized. Once they're separated, now we identify partners and agencies that will be able to use them as raw materials. And we have also been trying as much as possible to make sure that uh, the fractions are actually used by the local industry. Tony, Rwanda came out strongly on secondhand clothing. What's it doing about e-waste? We actually have a ban on the importation of used electronics. And this again is a policy decision really to address a lot of the issues which Joseph has just uh, highlighted because we recognize the impact and, and the positive impact of electronic devices. Customs duties or VAT, value added tax, uh, many of these charges are removed on uh, new electronic devices to incentivize its importation uh, for the local economy. Uh, in addition to that, of course, we have a local manufacturing industries that produce electronic devices. We have a, a number of industries that also uh, participate and undertake uh, electronic recycling of electronic waste. Uh, many of them scrap or strip a lot of these fractions either uh, for domestic industry or for export, part of the transboundary um, networks and, and so ensuring that those end up in the right landfills and so even ensuring that citizens can be empowered um, to, to address some of these issues at a community level um, is, is very important. You know, Gail, what really surprised me in looking at information on this was the issue of the Basel Convention and that people are able to just write on the containers, this is used electronics. And yet a huge portion of it is uh, too far gone to really be used. You know, when I buy a new phone or a new computer, they tell me they're recycling it. So what's really happening? I think there's a lot of ways to go about this. Does the importer have to post a bond so that when we start to open these cartons and see that there's absolute garbage, we charge them for having to recycle it safely? Or when we see that there is value in it, do we release the bond? Being able to unload containers should cost somebody something and there should be risks associated with it. Do we create industries that learn to reprocess these products? I mean, there's gonna be value and we have got to start thinking about a sustainable world. And that means not throwing things out, making things. Africa can play a huge role in taking leadership on this. We have to be able to work together and create standards that build a more sustainable world. As Joseph pointed out, there are some very valuable components. We hear all about rare earth minerals, about cobalt, about lithium. So being able to retrieve those things from used devices is actually not only environmentally friendly and makes the, the product much more sustainable, but there's money to be made and an industry to occur that can do that, but do it safely. And there's another side to used electronic devices that we really should discuss, which is the idea of remanufactured goods. If your Apple watch dies and you bring it back to Apple and it's still under warranty, if they take it and they give you another remanufactured one, it was somebody else who had a defective one that was returned and refurbished. And that came back into this country if it was refitted in China or somewhere or Taiwan or wherever, it comes back into the United States as a remanufactured good. I think it's something that other countries should be implementing. You know, Tony, what's becoming apparent in this discussion is there really are two issues. There's the issue 
of whether these goods should be coming in, whether that's dumping it, but then the other is the opportunity. I mean, abs- absolutely. The recycling sectors that are absolutely lucrative for a number of countries, Scandinavian countries be- being a good example. So the opportunity is there, uh, but we need to be, as, as Gail uh, rightly mentioned, more conscious in how we sustainably produce products, right? How do we start to make devices more long, long lasting? How do we start to allow for products to be remanufactured? If we're bringing secondhand clothing to your industry or to your country, let's develop a recycling sector as well. Um, and, and, and there's ways to do that. And, and there's conversations worth happen, uh, having, right? Rwanda is one of the few countries in Africa that manufactures phones. You have the Mara phone. Uh, uh, is that impacted by having uh, what is essentially e-waste coming in? Rwanda already bans the importation of used electronic devices, right? So this has really helped. That being said, we still have a huge gap um, in the market for electronic devices, specifically phones. So, so how do you actually start to attract other mobile manufacturers to come and set up uh, in the country? You can't do that when you have competing used phone markets, right? Uh, and so you have to also provide the trade policy that can support industrial policy. For Kenya, uh, importation of second-hand um, computers is a good thing. It's not bad from my perspective. It's only that that opportunity has been abused badly uh, by getting other devices that are clearly used, dumping them here in the country. When you look at Kenya, where it is today, the development of the ICT sector has been as a result of mostly the utilization of second-hand devices. Uh, with our agencies and government uh, uh, units, you could also come up with the, uh, good strategies and also good policy frameworks that will help us in evaluating and ascertaining the quality and the value of the electronic device coming into this country. If it is something that can work for five, six, seven years, for example, a computer, that could help young learners to learn more IT-related things for close to seven, eight years. And then we look at end of life management. We could look at the aspect of doing the extended producer responsibility and uh, the polluter pay principle. When you bring electronic device into this country, be it US or not, you pay upfront for the recycling. So you don't have recyclers struggling and asking people for uh, pay to manage their electronic devices. If you brought 10 tons of electronic devices and within a given period of time, it is assumed that they have, been, uh, they have become used. Can you show us where those electronic devices uh, were recycled? And that would move the responsibility from the general public to the polluters of this uh, uh, environment through electronic waste. We've covered two of the most egregious examples of donated goods being dumped in Africa. But there's so much more. Hospital equipment that is donated is often so damaged or out of date that it's no longer useful and instead ends up in landfills that are already overcrowded. More recently, with increases in hybrid and electric vehicle sales, old gas-guzzling cars are ending up in Africa's second-hand car market, adding to emissions on a continent that already is highly vulnerable to climate change. But what about the slogan, reduce, reuse, recycle? Isn't donating old goods to find usefulness in a new home a perfect example of recycling or even reusing, albeit by someone else? Isn't that the circular economy? The answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. So Gail, what should we be doing with our old goods? When it comes to medical devices, um, there's a really, there's a huge opportunity. What's going on right now in the United States is in terms of the escalation of new medical devices has reached a crazy level, which is there may be like the latest new MRI machine and any hospital that doesn't get it is now considered second tier. Now, that insane escalation is really an opportunity for many other countries to take advantage of very high quality equipment at a reasonable price. Interestingly enough, in some cases, that that equipment is really the best to go to certain places given the parameters of where these items are being placed. Um, But 
how do we make sure that it's only high quality devices? How can a government create laws or ways to import used equipment that makes them, A, number one, have to meet a minimum requirement of its um, abil its operational ability, its longevity, as well as its maintenance. And I think those are, you know, three really important factors. But there shouldn't be this blanket attitude that if it's used, we don't want it, because there's going to be used equipment that's going to be the best state-of-the-art equipment that could potentially operate in certain climates and in certain situations. You know, Joseph, your your work is in recycling, so very much in the reuse, recycle. What needs to be done? When you bring in um, uh, second-hand uh, medical equipment, it could be the best technology getting into this country for the very first time and something that we must appreciate. We do receive uh, medical waste and medical e-waste or e-waste coming from the medical sector. And for us to handle these ones, we must engage either the manufacturers or the operators of these systems to train our people to understand and know how to handle them in a manner that protects them as the technicians and also protects the environment. It's a very expensive process, but now it must be done for us to be safe and for the environment to be safe. Some of these devices, you find that now you do not have spare parts because they stop the production. And when they've stopped the production, how do you operate them? They could be expo exposing patients to harm because there could be components that are now uh, not functional. Such exposure would be uh, serious because those who are operating them do not know that uh, the effect is that serious. Those who manufacture these devices should have the expertise and the plan for decommissioning and also end of life management by building structures and infrastructure and the human capacity for those who will be handling them at the tail end of operation to manage them. There's one thing I wanted to raise. One of the things that has changed is digital printing and that if companies would have to provide some of the actual um, uh, specifications for some of the inputs, and you could legitimately export some relatively sophisticated equipment that could be maintained for a very long period of time now that digital printing was available. If you have given the spec sheet, you could throw it into a digital printer and repair that item or make this, you know, this part that needed to be replaced. So Tony, what do you think of that? I know this is a, maybe a touchy subject and I'll be careful how I raise this, but there also needs to be an element of innovation and allowing countries that import some of these used equipment to also tinker and play with them so that they can also develop their industries and they can also learn how to actually use some of this technology. So there needs to be a conscious technology transfer element as well. If you can allow local operators to learn how to work these equipment, then you can attract the investment that can actually produce it. So there's maybe a lot of elements here, trade policy, intellectual policy, um, investment, um, and, and other matters as well. So it needs to be looked at holistically, uh, in, in my opinion, and also selectively, right? Uh, and, and it's product by product. If I could add something, the renewable energy sector, the solar powered unit systems, they're all over. The PV panel that we use for solar uh, energy is very difficult to recycle. In about 20 to 25 years time, this will be e-waste. There is no accurate and tangible strategy that we could say would be used to process this. The batteries that are coming from the EV sector and also solar power systems, they are also problematic. We would be looking at second life years, which at that now we have already established a, a facility for second life version of, of the batteries. We are converting lithium ion batteries to battery packs that could be used for home lighting system and could also be used in the e-mobility sector. But there is a great challenge and a great issue uh, that should be uh, connected to the end of second life. Could we take responsibility for the end of life management? And by doing that, 
this is the right time for us to start before it becomes a menace, before it becomes a serious problem uh, to the general public. Could we have innovative ideas and local solutions that we could use to handle and address them? We need to, to maybe have a selective approach to some of these products. It needs to be what products are relevant under what conditions. So it is pick and choose. Find that we're very progressive when it comes to textiles because of where we stand. But when it comes to vehicles, we also have to take a different approach. What is the use period of, of this vehicle or, or this material? How long will it last on the local market? Uh, and what's the recycling uh, options that are available? But at the end of the day, it is an opportunity cost, right? Because on the one hand is, do you import something that can benefit your consumers and, and that addresses issues of consumer welfare? Or do you also look at issues of industrial development? So it needs to be weighed carefully. Now, you can certainly also implement policies that say, you know, there needs to be a stringent rule of origin. Uh, so these products need to be manufactured in a certain area. They need to be uh, to meet certain requirements, certain standards. You could also say, let's limit this to high skill, high tech products, right? That are absolutely required uh, and that could have a benefit on the local uh, economy. But when you're hampered and restricted from exporting because you're inundated with secondhand clothing or vehicles or electronics or other materials, it becomes very difficult for you to be able to develop a um, industrial sector. And what then starts to happen is you become, and, and unfortunately, you're limited and restricted to being on the periphery of the economic status. Um, and so that has to change. But that brings us to the end of our program. Thank you so much to my guest, Antoine Kajangwe, Director General of Trade and Investment, Rwanda Ministry of Trade and Industry. Gail Strickler, President for Global Trade at Brookfield Associates and former Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for Textiles. And Joseph Oliet, Manager of the WE Center, the Waste, Electrical and Electronic Equipment Center. To our viewers in Africa, America, and around the world, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Carol Pinot, host and producer of Africa USA Now. Additional production by Kellen Cody, Alessandra Salase, and Alicia Gupta. Editing by Batsy Freddy. Africa USA Now is presented by the World Trade Center, Washington, D.C. You can find us on YouTube and your favorite podcast apps. Be sure to follow us and leave a review. Our production partners are Africa Global Schaefer and Pixie Corner. A special thanks to the African Development Bank and the Africa Investment Forum for their support. Africa's investment marketplace is championed by the African Development Bank and its partners to accelerate the closure of the continent's investment gaps. For more information on Africa USA Now, visit us at africausanow.com. We hope you've enjoyed the program and that you'll continue to tune in as we delve further into the intersection of Africa and the United States.